to just uh, reinforce a couple of things that, that she said and then move on. Um, and that's the last few weeks, a lot of people have been throwing around the word occupation, as in Wall Street occupation, occupied DC, occupied Oakland. Damn it. Um, um, Jesus Christ. Um, okay, so I just want to start off by saying that the occupations, I think, of course, are, of course are very good. And any resistance against the corporate machine is good. But we need to remember that the occupations are taking place under a much larger occupation. We need to remember at all times that we're living on stolen land. This protest is taking place on stolen land. Oakland is founded on stolen land. The Bay Area is founded on stolen land. Oh, you missed some really good lines. Should we do the people's mic? Yeah. People's mic! No, I'll just, no, no, that would take us like three hours. Um, you gotta really talk into it. There, how you like that? Uh, the entire omnicidal economy is founded on stolen land. You know, would it be better if I just shout? Yes. Okay, can you hear this okay? Is that better? Which is better? Okay. Well, Combination. Hey, hey, hey. Wait, no, 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 no. We're going to, we have to come to consensus. So let's take a few more hours to, uh, okay. This. Not this. The people have spoken. Um. Perfect. Now yell and you're good. Okay. Okay. Um. So what is a government of occupation? What does it do? A government of occupation facilitates resource extraction and maximizes production at the expense of communities of the natural world. That's what they do by definition. So um, the United States, what does the United States government do? It facilitates resource extraction and maximizes production at the expense of communities of the natural world. The United States is functionally, systematically, a government of occupation. And capitalism is functionally, systematically, an economics of occupation. And of course, all my American Indian friends say, uh, what took you so long to freeze this one out? And once again, just look around. Um, where we're standing here is supposed to be oak forest. Where are the original inhabitants? Where are the grizzly bears? Where are the delta smelt? Where are the salmon? Where are the original human inhabitants? San Francisco Bay has collapsed. When the first whites here appeared here, whales were abundant, as were ducks, as were geese, as were so many others. There are still sea lions, but the first Spanish conquerors encountered so many, it looked like the beaches were paved with sea lions. This culture steals land bases from all their inhabitants, human and non-human alike, and then destroys them. That's what it does. We need to never forget that, and if we are to survive, we need to stop the planetary murder. In the reports I've seen of the various protests, I've seen a lot of people talking about jobs, a lot of people talking about corporate greed, and a lot of people talking about sharing the wealth, but I haven't seen a lot of people talking about the fact that the entire system, the entire system is based on land theft and on destroying the natural world. I think that needs to be the start of our conversations, because it should be painfully clear that the health of the planet is primary far more important than any economic system, in part because without a living planet, you have no economic system whatsoever. You cannot consume a planet and live on it. Only someone deeply insane, or an economist insofar as any difference, could think so. <clears throat> Asking for a bigger piece of the pie on a planet being murdered is a wee bit insufficient. And the wonderful thing is that these conversations are starting. By you being here, you are starting these conversations and starting the movement to end this larger occupation. <clears throat> so I'd like to start by thanking you for being here and thanking all the protesters, thanking all the revolutionaries, thanking all of you who are here doing this good and great thing, this honest and true thing, this mighty and righteous thing. Those of you who are holding hands through time and across space with those who have fought for freedom and justice, with John Brown, with Frederick Douglass, with Tecumseh, with the Wobblies and the Suffragists, with Helen Keller, with civil rights workers and union members, with Ken Sarawi, with, with people in Arab Spring, with people the world over who are fighting for the right of self-determination, 
with the poor and the landless, with indigenous peoples fighting for their land, with groups like the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta fighting to stop transnational corporations and the governments who serve them from destroying their land and its people. I'd like to thank all of you who are here because you understand that unless we wrest power away from corporations, unless this culture is stopped, that it will for all practical purposes end life on Earth. 200 species were driven extinct today, and 200 yesterday, and 200 the day before that. 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone. 98% of the native forests, 99% of the native prairies. Salmon are depending upon you, as are tigers and orangutans and coral reefs, monarch butterflies and red-legged frogs, western lilies and wild bison and Florida panthers. Of course, this corporate culture kills humans too. Human languages and human cultures are being driven extinct at an even faster relative rate than wild species. Capitalism and imperialism kill more than a million human children per year. That's almost two each and every minute, each and every day. Corporations are killing the planet, and they are killing us. We have long been taught that the legal system is set up to protect us, but we have been lied to. It is well established that judicial accountability does not extend to those who maim or kill in the name of business, nor to those who impoverish our land bases. Since the legal system won't hold destructive institutions accountable, the responsibility falls on each of us. This means that all of us who care about salmon, for example, must learn to be accountable to salmon rather than loyal to political and economic institutions that do not serve us well. The same is true for those who care about the San Francisco Bay, for those who care about democracy, for those who care about communities, for those who care about the future, for those who care about any living being. And we must act on this loyalty. We must do whatever is necessary to protect our homes and our land bases from those who would destroy them. Only then will salmon be saved and forests. Only then will toxic dumping be stopped. Only then will we have democratic self-governance. Only then will we have a future. Because allowing destructive economic or political entities to destroy our land base is not merely unethical and unwise, but suicidal. The Declaration of Independence states that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. It would be more precise, however, to say that it is not the right of the people, nor even their responsibility, but instead something more like breathing, something that if we fail to do, we die. If we as a people fail to rid our community of destructive institutions, those institutions will destroy our community. And if we as a community cannot provide meaningful and non-destructive ways for people to gain food, clothing, and shelter, then we must recognize it's not just specific destructive institutions, but the entire economic system that's pushing the natural world past breaking points. Once we've recognized the destructiveness of the economic system, we have no choice unless we wish to sign our own and our children's death warrants, but to fight for all we're worth and in every way we can to overturn it. There's nothing else to do. So you can ask, by quoting the Declaration of Independence, am I calling for revolution? To which I will respond that the answer should be clear. You can then ask if this means that I'm calling for the overthrow of the United States government. To which I will respond that this question comes far, far, far too late. <laughs> The government was long since overthrown, and those who overthrew it are known as ExxonMobil, British Petroleum, Halliburton, Monsanto, ADM, Walmart, Massey Coal, Goldman Sachs, Citibank. They are the real governors, and the United States government is a wholly owned subsidiary, brought to you by McDonald's, Pfizer, and Lockheed Martin. So then you can ask, am I advocating the overthrow of a government that is by foreign up corporations? Am I advocating the overthrow of the corporate state? To which I'll say, hell yes. <laughs> Earlier, I thanked all of you for being here, um, but I want to be clear that my gratitude doesn't extend to everybody here. Um, and I want now to speak to the exceptions. And I don't know if they can hear this, but I have a different message for the police. <laughs> which is this. There have been scores and then hundreds and then thousands of accounts of Egyptian and Syrian police and military personnel who not only refused to attack protesters, but who joined them. I have heard of only one account of police officers in the United States who refuse to do violence to, that is to assault, to attack, or to arrest, because an arrest is violence as well, American citizens. It was in Albany, New York. Let's be clear about what this means. 
with the exception of police in Albany, New York, I have yet to hear of a single police officer in the United States who's had the courage and the integrity to do what so many in Egypt and Syria have done. So let me ask it this way of the police. How does it feel to be more repressive, less courageous, and have less integrity and honor than security forces in open military dictatorships? <laughs> I didn't get around to this, but I seriously considered making a whole lot of little yellow paper badges to hand out to police officers, each one saying, I serve the corporate state. All right. So if the police had integrity and honor and courage, they would turn around their guns and aim them at the capitalists who are destroying what's left of this country's democracy. They were destroying what's left of life on the planet. I've heard reports that in some cities like Washington, D.C., the behavior of police has not been as appalling and repressive as it has been in others, like Oakland or New York. I've heard reports that in some cities like Washington, D.C., the behavior of police has not been as appalling and repressive as it has been in others, like Oakland or New York. But we all have to admit that not beating or shooting or pepper spraying protesters is a pretty low standard. <laughs> I actually suggest a much higher standard. Join us. Try to give them an injection of some of the courage and integrity and honor that they are thus far completely refusing to manifest. I want to explore a few examples of police and military who have, the cur who have had that courage and integrity. In the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, militia in Pittsburgh refused to fire on strikers. In Harrisburg, PA, the militia shook hands with protesters and gave them their guns. Let's see if that happens. <laughs> In 1917, the Tsar's police refused to shoot at protesters in Petrograd. In the 1930s in the UK, police not only refused to arrest protesters, but stood in solidarity with them. In 1990, First Nations people in Canada blockaded rail lines, and when the Canadian government ordered the police to break the blockade, the local constabulary refused to follow orders. Of course, the peaceful revolutions in Eastern Europe were made peaceful because the police opened their arms and their armories to the resistance. Others have done it you, police officers, would not be the first nor by any means the last. Have that courage. One man in Syria said, we received the order from our officers to shoot at anything that moved, even unarmed children and the elderly in Harasta. We got close to them, we threw our weapons on the ground and the people protected us. When our officers saw that, they opened fire on us. One of my colleagues was hit in the shoulder, but we succeeded in taking him into hiding. How does it feel to be less democratic and less courageous than police in an autocratic government? Don't let that man's courage put you to shame. Follow his example. Follow the example of the Libyan Air Force members who refused to attack their own people. Follow the example of the 25-year-old Bahraini policeman, Ali Shazim al Ghanimi. When he heard that protesters in Bahrain were being shot by police, he went to the hospital and helped the medics treating the wounded. Dressed in his uniform, he went to the crowd and protesters and publicly announced he would no longer work for the repressive dictatorship. Don't we all wish that the police here had his courage? Yes. These people are facing death for their courage. The police here are not. They're facing what? A departmental memo? Their boss's annoyance? Not death. The police need to refuse to assault protesters, refuse to fire at protesters, refuse to harm protesters, refuse to arrest protesters. They need to do the right thing. And I can think of many reasons why they should join us. The first is that they have far more in common with us than they do with them. We share class interests. Neither of us are the rich. They steal from us like they steal from the, they, they steal from the cops like they steal from everybody else. They poison the cops like they poison us. For all the ruling class's pretty words, the elite hold you, the cops, as like us, members of the working class, the poor, the middle class, in as much contempt as they do others of the disposable, the others of the not rich, the others they use and throw away. Make no mistake, they will throw you away. Look at how they treat military veterans. And here's the point, they destroy your future just like they destroy ours. The second reason the cops should join us is that it's the right and moral thing to do. A couple of years ago, I communicated with a policeman who wanted me to understand that it's the job of police to protect people from sociopaths. I agreed, and then I asked why it is that they don't protect us from rich sociopaths. <laughs> And my African-American friends ask why they so rarely protect African-Americans from racism, from functional racism. And my women friends ask why they so rarely protect women from misogyny. Only 6% of rapists spend even one night in jail. 
Speaking of misogyny, there's actually something else I need to address, which is I've seen many accounts of rapes happening at various occupies, and the response to these rapes by the Occupy movement in general has been appalling. There's been a lot of victim blaming and a near complete refusal to hold rapists accountable. In one city, they were trying to talk women out of reporting the rapes for fear would embarrass the movement. But what's embarrassing is the rapists, and what's embarrassing are the rapes themselves, and what's embarrassing is the response by the Occupy movement to the rapes. In one town, the Occupy movement put out a statement that refused to use gender-specific language about women being raped, saying, quote, if he, she, if he slash she is raped, what the fuck use is the use of a movement ostensibly aimed at holding the exploiters of Wall Street accountable when so many men in this movement aren't even willing to hold rapists accountable? I know that many of you perceive the cops as the enemy, rightly so. I know that many of the cops have comported themselves as the enemy, but for once make them do their fucking job. Yeah. If a man rapes a woman, and if you are not willing to deal with him as he needs to be dealt with, then for crying out loud, turn him over to the cops. Wow, that went over well. <laughs> um, oh, here's an interesting, interesting question. If you did turn the rapist over to the cops, do you think the cops would beat the rapist? They arrest me huh. for calling them up. So if they won't beat a rapist and they'll beat a protester, what does that say about their priorities? Okay, what I want for everybody here to do, I want everybody at this particular place to pledge right now in public that you'll have a zero tolerance policy for the abuse of women. Right now, I want every man to raise your hand and say out loud, I will not rape and I will not tolerate rape. I will not rape and I will not tolerate rape. You know, that's probably the first time in the history of the planet that 200 men have said that at the same time. I was hoping that there would be cops closer because I was going to ask them to raise their hands for this too. But uh, I strongly suspect they wouldn't have. Um, I had a whole nice set of jokes associated with that. What? Yeah, okay, would any, um, would any undercover cops please raise your hand? <laughs> it's going to work one of these days. Uh, okay, but now I'm going to go back to the idea of the police. And i got a question for them, another question, which is why don't you protect us from these sociopaths? I'm not just talking about rapists, but about capitalists. Why, when there's a strike, do the cops protect the capitalists from the strikers? Why do they not protect the strikers from the capitalists? They use their batons on strikers. Why don't they use their batons to force capitalists to come to terms? Can you imagine like one of those G20 things or IMF things if all the cops suddenly turned around and put their guns on the... Uh... Why do you not do your job and protect us from them? Why have you not arrested Tony Hayward for murdering humans in the Gulf of Mexico and for murdering the Gulf of Mexico? Where were you in Massachusetts? Coal murdered miners, and where are you when Massey Coal murders entire mountains? Where are you when chemical companies kill so many people, so many children, the entire region's called Cancer Alley? And where were you when our democracy was stolen? Why aren't you doing your job? Of course, we can ask these same questions not just of police but of ourselves. If the cops won't do the job to stop the sociopaths, then we're the ones who have to do it. Frankly, if the cops don't have the courage to help, at the very least, they should have the common decency to get out of the way. Oh, oh. So here's a couple riddles, not very funny. Question. What do you get when you cross a long drug habit, a quick temper, and a gun? Answer. Two life terms for murder, earliest release date 2026. Question. What do you get when you cross two nation states, a large corporation, 40 tons of poison, and at least 8,000 dead human beings? Answer, retirement with full pay and benefits. That's Warren Anderson, CEO of Union Carbide, Bhopal. Here's another one. What do you call someone who conspires to put poison in the subways of Tokyo? Answer, a terrorist who's put in prison for life. Question, what do you call someone who conspires to put poison in water supplies in the United States? Answer, Dick Cheney. <laughs> An oil and gas man, a fracker, a capitalist. Or if the specific poison is cyanide, we call it a transnational gold mining corporation. Just to make sure we get it, what consequence does someone pay for murdering humans and non-humans in the Gulf of Mexico? Answer, a million dollar a year severance package and millions of shares of British Petroleum stock. The guy shouldn't receive stocks, he should be put in them.
So the real question is, um, who are the cops protecting and who are they serving? It's not we the people when corporations rule. And we all know that corporations run the government. I ask people all over the country, does the government take better care of human beings or corporations? Nobody ever says humans. Most people laugh. It's a ridiculous question. Of course the government takes better care of corporations than it does human beings. So what would happen if, with or without the cops' help, we were to join to enforce cancer-free zones, oil spill-free zones, extinction-free zones, home foreclosure-free zones? Hell, we could enforce rape-free zones, hunger-free zones, economic and political democracy zones. And what if these zones were to extend across, all across the country? I guess it's called a revolution, isn't it? So here's a question for all of us. If you're going to have a government, and if you're going to have a government that's worth a good goddamn, whom should the government serve? Corporations or human beings? Humans. Well, oh, that's awfully tepid. Um, and the environment. Um, so it's like, who should protect? Humans or corporations? And it's like, humans! humans. That's better. Um, Let's try it one more time. Who should, who should a government serve? Corporations or human beings? Humans! Fish! Fish human beings! That's true. Um, so that actually the sound of all your voices here is the third reason that the cops should join us because I know the cops want to be on the winning side and uh, we're sure as hell going to win. Yeah. So when a government becomes destructive of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and it's long past time we made full use of our rights.